Chapter 6 Planet of the Damned by Harry Harrison. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Planet of the Damned by Harry Harrison. Chapter 6 Identify yourself, please. The quiet words from the speaker in no way appeared to coincide with the picture on the screen. The spacer that had matched their orbit over Dis had recently been a freighter. A quick conversion had tacked the hulking shape of a primary weapons turret on top of her hull. The black disk of the immense muzzle pointed squarely at them. Isle switched open the ship-to-ship -ship communication channel. This is Isle, retinal pattern 490-BJ4-67 which is also the code that is supposed to get me through your blockade. Do you want to check that pattern? There will be no need, thank you. If you will turn on your recorder, I have a message relayed to you from Prime 4. Recording and out, Isle said. Damn, trouble already, and four days to blow up. Prime 4 is our headquarters on Dis. This ship carries a cover cargo so we can land at the spaceport. This is probably a change of plan, and I don't like the smell of it. There was something behind Isle's grumbling this time, and without conscious effort, Brienne could sense the chilling touch of the other man's angst. Trouble was waiting for them on the planet below. When the message was typed by the decoder, Isle hoovered over it, reading each word as it appeared on the paper. When it was finished, he only snorted and went below to the galley. Brienne pulled the message out of the machine and read it. Isle, Isle, Isle. Spaceport landing danger. Night landing preferable. Coordinates, map, 46, J92, MN75. Remote your ship. Vian will meet. End, end, end. Dropping into the darkness was safe enough. It was done on instruments, and the Dissons were thought to have no detection apparatus. The altimeter dial spun backwards to zero, and a soft vibration was the only indication they had landed. All of the cabin lights were off, except for the fluorescent glow of the instruments. A white speckled gray filled the infrared screen, radiation from the still warm sand and stone. There were no moving blips on it, not the characteristic shape of a shielded atomic generator. We're here first, Isle said opaquing the ports, and turning on the cabin lights. They blinked at each other, faces damp with perspiration. "'Must you have the ship this hot?' Leah asked, patting her forehead with an already sodden kerchief. Stripped of her heavier clothing, she looked even tinier to Brian. But the thin cloth tunic, barely reaching halfway to her knees, concealed very little. Small she may have appeared to him. Unfeminine she was not. Her breasts were full and high, her waist tiny enough to offset the outward curve of her hips. "'Shall I turn around so you can stare at the back, too?' she asked Brian. Five days' experience had taught him that this type of remark was best ignored. It only became worse if he tried to make an intelligent answer. "'This is hotter than this cabin,' he said, changing the subject. By raising the interior temperature, we can at least prevent any sudden shock when we go out. I know the theory, but it doesn't stop me from sweating, she said curtly. Best thing you can do is sweat, Isle said. He looked like a glistening captive balloon in shorts. Finishing a bottle of beer, he took another from the freezer. Have a beer. No, thank you. I'm afraid it would dissolve the last shreds of tissue, and my kidneys would float completely away. On earth we were never. Get Professor Maurice's luggage for her, Isle interrupted. Vian's coming. There's a signal. I'm sending the ship up before any of the locals spot it. When he cracked the outer port, the puff of air struck them like an exhaust from a furnace, dry and hot as a tongue of flame. Brienne heard Leah's gasp in the darkness. She stumbled down the ramp, and he followed her slowly, careful of the weight of packs and equipment he carried. The sand, still hot from the day, burned through his boots. Isle came last, the remote control unit in his hand. As soon as they were clear, he activated it, and the ramp slipped back like a giant tongue. As soon as the lock had swung shut, the ship lifted and drifted upward silently towards its orbit, a shrinking darkness against the stars. 
there was just enough starlight to see the sandy wastes around them, as wave-filled as a petrified sea. The dark shape of a sand-car drew up over a dune and hummed to a stop. When the door opened, Isle stepped towards it, and everything happened at once. Isle broke into a blue nimbus of crackling flame, his skin blackening, charred. He was dead in an instant. A second pillar of flame bloomed next to the car, and a choking scream was cut off at the moment it began. Isle died silently. Brian was diving, even as the electrical discharges still crackled in the air. The boxes and packs dropped from him, and he slammed against Leah, knocking her to the ground. He hoped she had the sense to stay there and be quiet. This was his only conscious thought. The rest was reflex. He was rolling over and over as fast as he could. The spitting electrical flames flared again, playing over the bundles of luggage he had dropped. This time Brian was expecting it, pressed flat on the ground a short distance away. He was facing the darkness away from the sand car and saw the brief blue glow of the ion rifle discharge. His own gun was in his hand. When Isle had given him the missile weapon, he had asked no questions, but had just strapped it on. There had been no thought he would need it this quickly. Holding it firmly before him in both hands, he let his body aim at the spot where the glow had been. A whiplash of explosive slugs ripped the night air. They found their target, and something thrashed voicelessly and died. In the brief instant after he fired, a jarring weight landed on his back, and a line of fire circled his throat. Normally he fought with a calm mind, with no thoughts other than of the contest. But Isle, a friend, a man of Anvar, had died a few seconds before, and Brian found himself welcoming this physical violence and pain. There are many foolish and dangerous things that can be done, such as smoking next to high-octane fuel, and putting fingers into electrical sockets. Just as dangerous, and equally deadly, is physically attacking a winner of the twenties. Two men hit Brian together, though this made very little difference. The first died suddenly, as hands like steel claws found his neck, and in a single spasmodic contraction did such damage to the large blood vessels there that they burst, and tiny hemorrhages filled his brain. The second man had time for a single scream, though he died just as swiftly when those hands closed on his larynx. Running in a crouch, partially on his knuckles, Brian swiftly made a circle of the area, gun ready. There were no others. Only when he touched the softness of Leah's body did the blood anger seep from him. He was suddenly aware of the pain and fatigue, the sweat soaking his body, and the breath rasping in his throat. Holstering the gun, he ran light fingers over her skull, finding a bruised spot on one temple. Her chest was rising and falling regularly. She had struck her head when he pushed her. It had undoubtedly saved her life. Sitting down suddenly, he let his body relax, breathing deeply. Everything was a little better now, except for the pain at his throat. His fingers found a thin strand on the side of his neck, with a knobby weight on the end. There was another weight on his other shoulder, and a thin line of pain across his neck. When he pulled on them both, the strangler's cord came away in his hand. It was thin fiber, strong as a wire. When it had been pulled around his neck, it had sliced the surface skin and flesh like a knife, halted only by the corded bands of muscle below. Brian threw it from him, into the darkness where it had come from. He could think again, and carefully kept his thoughts from the men he had killed. Knowing it was useless, he went to Isle's body. A single touch of the scorched flesh was enough. Behind him Leah moaned with returning consciousness, and he hurried on to the sand-car, stepping over the charred body outside the door. The driver slumped, dead, killed, perhaps, by the same strangling cord that had sunk into Brian's throat. He laid the man gently on the sand, and closed the lids over the staring horror of the eyes. There was a canteen in the car, and he brought it back to Leah. "'My head! I've hurt my head!' she said groggily. Just a bruise, he reassured her. Drink some of this water, and you'll soon feel better. Lie back. Everything's over for the moment, and you can rest. Isle's dead, Leah said with sudden shocked memory. They've killed him. What's happened? She tensed, tried to rise, and he pressed her back gently. I'll tell you everything. Just don't try to get up yet. 
There was an ambush, and they killed Vian and the driver of the sand-car, as well as Isle. Three men did it, and they're all dead now, too. I don't think there are any more around, but if there are, I'll hear them coming. We're just going to wait a few minutes, until you feel better, then we're getting out of here in the car. Bring the ship down! There was a thin note of hysteria in her voice. We can't stay here alone. We don't know where to go or what to do. With Isle dead, the whole thing's spoiled. We have to get out. There are some things that can't sound gentle, no matter how gently they are said. This was one of them. I'm sorry, Leah, but the ship is out of our reach right now. Isle was killed with an ion gun, and it fused the control unit into a solid lump. We must take the car and get to the city. We'll do it now. See if you can stand up. I'll help you. She rose, not saying anything, and as they walked towards the car, a single reddish moon cleared the hills behind them. In its light, Brian saw a dark line bisecting the rear panel of the sand car. He stopped abruptly. What's the matter? Leah asked. The unlocked engine cover could only have one significance, and he pushed it open, knowing in advance what he would see. The attackers had been very thorough and fast. In the short time available to them, they had killed the driver and the car as well. Ruddy light shone on torn wires, ripped out connections. Repair would be impossible. I think we'll have to walk, he told her, trying to keep the gloom out of his voice. This spot is roughly a hundred and fifty kilometers from the city of Hovestadt, where we have to go. We should be able to. We're going to die. We can't walk anywhere. This whole planet is a death trap. Let's get back in the ship. The shrillness of hysteria was at the edge of her voice, as well as a subtle slurring of sounds. Brian didn't try to reason with her, or bother to explain. She had a concussion from the blow. That much was obvious. He had her sit and rest while he made what preparations he could for the long walk. Clothing first. With each passing minute the desert air was growing colder as the day's heat ebbed away. Leah was beginning to shiver, and he took some heavier clothing from her charred bag and made her pull it on over her light tunic. There was little else that was worth carrying. The canteen from the car and a first aid kit he found in one of the compartments. There were no maps and no radio. Navigation was obviously done by compass on this almost featureless desert. The car was equipped with an electrically operated gyro compass of no use to him now. But he did use it to check the direction of Hovestad, as he remembered it from the map, and found it lined up perfectly with the tracks the car had cut into the sand. It had come directly from the city. They could find their way by backtracking. Time was slipping away. He would have liked to bury Isle and the men from the car, but the night hours were too valuable to be wasted. The best he could do was to put the three corpses in the car for protection from the dissonant animals. He locked the door and threw the key as far as he could into the darkness. Leah had slipped into a restless sleep, and he carefully shook her awake. Come, said Brienne, we have a little walking to do. End of chapter 6